morning. My name is Julianne Smith. I'm the director of the Europe program here at CSIS. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a very toasty uh, summer day to talk about U.S. interests and strategy in the high north. Somewhat appropriate. I hope it will cool us all down a bit. Um, as you're all well aware, of course, uh, Arctic issues and high north issues aren't in U.S. headlines at the moment. Um, but I think we'll see them creeping into our headlines. They're certainly in the headlines for many of our friends and allies around the world. Uh, and so we wanted to have a chat today about U.S. interests, how the United States looks at this very delicate region, not just because of energy resources, all of the oil and gas reserves uh, that are up in the, in the region, but also because of the melting ice caps uh, and, of course, uh, various territorial claims that have created some friction among the countries that border uh, this region. We're so pleased to have with us today Senator Lisa Murkowski from the state of Alaska. She's the ranking member on the Energy Subcommittee on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. She's also on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, where she is ranking member for the Subcommittee on East Asian and Pacific Affairs. We're so pleased to have Senator Murkowski with us because this is an issue that's very near and dear to her heart. She's followed this issue very closely. She's given a number of speeches on it, and she's been very active in particular on law of the sea issues, so we couldn't think of anyone more appropriate to join us today and kick off this discussion with an overview of U.S. interests in the Arctic uh, region. She is unfortunately only with us for a short period of time. We're going to give her a few minutes to make some opening remarks. We'll then open the floor for her questions. And then we also have a very distinguished panel of experts here to talk to us about various energy security and geopolitical interests uh, in the region. And then they can take your questions as well. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Senator Murkowski. Thank you and good morning. It is a, a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I say that sincerely, although I have to tell you, I go outside on mornings like this and really do wish that I were back in the Arctic where the, uh, where the climbs are just a little more comfortable for my, my liking. But I appreciate uh, greatly the opportunity to, to speak to you about the Arctic. Um, it is a topic that uh, I classify as, as one of my favorites, and for lots of good reasons. I'm talking about my home. I'm talking about an area of interest internationally that is, is just taking off. We have long known about the potential in the Arctic. We have long advertised that there is so much up there that is as yet unexplored. You talk about those great last frontiers, and this is, this is the Arctic that we're talking about. We need to recognize that here in this country, we have been an Arctic nation since the purchase of Alaska from Russia back in 1867. And I'm, I'm relatively confident that those of you here in the room are aware of the fact that we are an Arctic nation. Our challenge, quite generally, is to, is to get the public to understand that not only does the United States have uh, land in the Arctic, but how critical that land is, how critical the Arctic is for the United States. We are seeing uh, the Arctic come up in, in discussions uh, in the news, certainly lately, as we're talking about uh, climate change, the impacts of climate change. The fact is, is that we are seeing the impacts in the far north at, at a far um, heightened rate, an unprecedented rate within the region. And this really does make the Arctic uh, the most vital place to be studying climate change and the impacts uh, of climate change on the entire planet. Just this last summer, for the first time, we saw the Northwest Passage completely ice-free. This is the first time in recorded history that this famed, fabled Northwest Passage has, has been open. Canada, what did they do? They responded by announcing plans for an Arctic military training facility and a deep water port in the Northwest Passage. They then followed that up by calling for the construction of, of six to eight ice-strengthened patrol boats. Uh, they intend that these be in operation by 2014, um, working to assert their sovereignty claim in the Arctic. Uh, 
I, I'm, I'm sure that I don't need to, uh, to tell any of you for the first time uh, about the Russians. Um, very public demonstration. Uh, some compared it to the U.S. planting a, a flag on the moon when the, the Russian-led team uh, descended 13,000 feet to the seabed. This was August 2nd of, of last year, planted the, the Russian flag uh, directly on the North Pole. Um, I know that when I saw the cover of Time magazine, it was one of those, whoa, uh, that's quite a statement. Now, this, this very intense interest in claiming Arctic territory is, I think, primarily driven for the quest uh, for Arctic resources. Uh, until recently, um, I think we recognized that the resources of the Arctic were really too difficult. They were deemed too difficult and too expensive to develop. But with the increasing prices that we're seeing, uh, the, the increase availability, the increased access that we have, um, the Arctic's wealth is, is truly uh, becoming more accessible. We anticipate, and this is a conservative estimate, that the Arctic's wealth uh, is estimated to contain up to 25 percent of the world's remaining oil and gas reserves, including over 100 billion barrels of oil. Um, that's potential for us, folks. We're spending a lot of time and energy, literally, uh, on the Senate floor talking about energy and what we do. And uh, many of us are using the, the, uh, the catchphrase, uh, find more, use less. Well, when you're talking about finding more, if the potential for 25 percent of the, of the world's remaining oil and gas reserves are in the Arctic, this ought to get people's attention. Russia is turning its eye to the Arctic's vast energy reserves. They're building the first offshore oil rig that can withstand temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius and, and withstand the, the, the crush of the heavy pack ice. They're also reducing taxes and bureaucratic hurdles in order to encourage um, this new development in the Arctic. The maritime activities that relate to the transportation of, of goods and oil and gas, tourism. Um, I never really thought, I'm, I love the North, uh, but I've never really thought about the far, far North as being the place to go for your summer cruise. But the fact of the matter is, last year we had three cruise vessels uh, going through. Um, uh, this year it's supposed to be nine. I haven't heard back from anybody as to how the cruise was, but uh, uh, it's happening. It's happening. Um, the research opportunities that are underway as, as access to the Arctic Ocean increases. Work is, is already underway to determine the way forward in, in development of, of a shipping regime through the northern sea route, the Northwest Passage, and even directly over the pole. This is going to be extremely important as we figure out uh, just the maritime commerce. How, how do we handle uh, increased traffic in an area that has never seen traffic. The dramatic uh, retreat of Arctic sea ice has focused much attention on the development of these routes, but we have to recognize that in order to be a viable option to the Suez or the Panama Canals, the need for a comprehensive, a, a truly comprehensive plan that addresses the safety uh, the security, the navigation, the environmental protection, which is a huge issue, vessel standards, the economics, all these factors, all these need to be put into place. Now, I said uh, when I started that the Arctic is truly our last frontier. It's one of the few places on the Earth where all the borders really haven't been drawn on the map. Think about it. Everywhere else in the world, in some of the countries, uh, uh, they kind of redraw their borders every now and again. But we just don't really have any borders uh, up north. And, uh, and some of the borders that are drawn are disputed. There was, a, there was an article in, um, in the Sunday insert in the Parade uh, magazine. This was um, several months back. And, and the, the cover was the race to own the Arctic. It, it brought a lot of attention to the region. Um, that publication has about 70 million uh, American viewers on a Sunday morning. 
But it was the title of that article that emphasized the competition that is underway to own the resources by extending continental shelf claims. And while these, these anticipated claims do overlap in, in many cases, there does exist an opportunity to address those claims in many of the other key issues in the Arctic um, and to address them cooperatively and, and multilaterally. In, in May of this year, May 28th, uh, representatives of five coastal states bordering uh, the Arctic, uh, this was Canada, Denmark, Norway, Russia, and the United States, they met in uh, Ilulasset in, in Greenland. They adopted at that time a declaration of cooperation in the Arctic. And those representatives recognized at the time the, the truly the undeniable uniqueness of the Arctic region and the dramatic changes that are occurring there with the potential for, for profound effects on the environment and the indigenous peoples of the region. The Ilulasset Declaration recognizes the responsibilities of the Arctic nations to be good stewards and to work together to protect a very fragile Arctic environment. The Arctic is a marine environment surrounded by continents and a shipping disaster, an oil spill, would not just affect the, the very local area, but could jeopardize the entire Arctic ecosystem and cause irreversible damage. So there is, there is need to, uh, to really be working cooperatively, to really make sure that we have the environmental protections in place. The, the declaration that was made there in Greenland supports the Law of the Sea Treaty as the legal framework for governance in the Arctic, saying that uh, a new international legal regime is not needed to govern this region. Um, I agree with that most definitely. If the law of the sea is the overarching legal mechanism, then it's even more crucial that we as, as a nation ratify this treaty. Uh, Russia has submitted an extended continental shelf claim. They ex uh, submitted this back in 2002. And their submission uh, asked for uh, 460,000 square miles off of the Arctic Ocean's bottom resources. This is an area the size of, of Texas, California, and Indiana combined. Now, their claim was rejected for lack of technical data, but they have since resubmitted their claim with new data following this flag planting expedition uh, last summer. Denmark and Canada are also anxious to establish their own claims in the Arctic. Uh, Norway's claim is currently under review by the Commission on, on the Limits on the Continental Shelf. But here in the United States, here in our country, we're not able to make a claim until we ratify the Convention. Now, there are some of my colleagues who don't see the point in, in joining the rest of the world in ratifying this treaty. They say that, well, the United States enjoys the benefits of the treaty, even though we're not a member, and uh, their suggestion is, is that by not becoming a member of the treaty, we can kind of pick and choose which sections we abide by um, while not subjecting our actions to international law. I, I strongly believe that it is so important for the United States to be a party to this treaty, to be a player at the table in the process, rather than hoping that our interests are not going to be damaged. A session to the Convention would give current and future administrations both enhanced credibility and leverage in calling upon other nations to meet Convention responsibilities. Given the support for the treaty by the Arctic nations and the drive to develop natural resources, the treaty will also provide the environmental framework to develop these resources while minimizing those environmental impacts. Now, uh, the U.S. Arctic Research uh, Commission has, has uh, asserted that if the United States were to become party to the treaty, we could lay claim as the, the United States, we could lay claim to an area in the Arctic of about 450,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of the state of California. So you, you, you look up north at, at, at the map of Alaska and the, the north slope there and envision California planted on top of that. That's what we're talking about in terms of, of additional uh, mass. 
But if we do not become a party to the treaty, our opportunity to make this claim and our opportunity to have the international community respect it diminishes considerably, as does our ability to prevent claims like Russia's from coming to fruition. The administration has shown a strong leadership in being a party to the Ilulissat Declaration and our intentions to work cooperatively with other Arctic nations. So it's time for the U.S., for, the, for those of us in the Senate, to take that next step and to ratify the, the treaty. Now, there are, there, are another, uh, there are other ways in which the United States is, is leading the way in the Arctic. Um, I, I think most of you probably know that that we're in the middle of the international polar year. Our science budget for the Arctic research is the most of, of any country. And through the efforts of the scientists that are engaged in IPY, they're working on over 100 uh, scientific projects with scientists from all over the world. Um, I am very hopeful that, that IPY and all that is happening uh, with these uh, uh, research projects will, will usher in an era of of, of enhanced and um, uh, really robust scientific cooperation and collaboration in the Arctic. Congress just recently passed a resolution which the President has signed into law to develop an international fisheries regime for the Arctic. Alaska, like Norway and Iceland, have been very, very successful in managing our fisheries, and there's every reason to believe that this will continue with a very precautionary approach in the Arctic. Uh, in fact, the North, uh, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, this is the advisory bo body for the Federal Fisheries off of Alaska, they have proactively closed all fisheries in the Arctic until we have an assessment of the fish stocks um, made and, and a management plan developed. So we're being very proactive in that, in that effort. And while the U.S. Is a, is a world leader in some facets of the Arctic, I think there are other areas where, where questions justifiably should be asked. Are we a leader? Is the United States a leader when it comes to addressing climate change? What about sustainable energy development, alternative energy, environmental protection? We need to be leaders in all of these areas. We have an incredible opportunity to develop an international policy and a cooperative regime in the Arctic. We have, we have a very fragile ecosystem, we recognize, but our our, our first effort to, um, to do things in the Arctic really may be our only chance to get it right. We sit on the edge of a precipice with continued change projected to occur whether we are prepared or not. And how we address this challenge and how we adapt in the Arctic will be an example, I believe, for the rest of the world. The Ililasset de Declaration gives us hope that international cooperation among Arctic nations is possible, and by working together to develop a framework for governing the region that we can mutually provide for its protection and its preservation. We're only going to succeed in the Arctic if it's a commitment that all the nations share and undertake together. I think that the future of the Arctic is dependent on that level of cooperation. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Happy to take a few questions this morning, if, if time permits. Great. Thank you, Senator, for such a thorough overview of all the complex issues that come together in this very delicate region. We really appreciate you stopping by this morning, and we appreciate you taking a few questions. I'm going to open up the floor. Uh, who would like to begin? Please do wait for the microphone and introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind. First question? Yes. Go ahead. Bob, we'll wait. I'm Bob Abel from CSIS. I want to recognize that your father was a congressional co-chair of a study we did about seven years ago on the geopolitics of energy into the 21st century. Unfortunately, we didn't recognize the Arctic as an issue at that time. Mm -hmm. My question relates somewhat to the issue at hand. I was in Juneau in April of this year, and I woke up in the morning to find that a snow avalanche had taken out one and a half miles of electric power lines carrying hydroelectric power to the city of Juneau. Mm -hmm. Being re had, had to be replaced by diesel fuel, but rates were going to go up to 55 cents per kilowatt hour. Do you know whether that line has been returned to action or is it still down? 
the, the situation in Juneau was very desperate at the time, and, and you were there, uh, probably recognized the, 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 the great concern in a community where when your electricity rates literally jump five-fold overnight. That was the situation in Juneau. The good news for Juneau is uh, the people came together in an exceptional way uh, to reduce their energy consumption literally overnight. They were able, as a community, to reduce their energy consumption by 30 percent. That's phenomenal. And it's it, it kind of funny, if those of you who haven't been to Juneau, it's our, it's our state capital. Uh, they like to think of themselves relatively sophisticated and, and worldly. Uh, but it's a small community, uh, about 20,000 or so. And uh, uh, they took great pride in going neighbor to neighbor saying, well, what are you doing? Well, I haven't bathed in six days, and we're not going to wash clothes until... And Juno is in the midst of, of, a, of a rainforest, and April, um, it's not warm there by any stretch of the imagination. And there was one comment by a guy saying, you know, I've had my jeans out on the line now for six days, and they're still not dry. So people really did jump in and, and make an effort. The good news story was that they were able to restore those lines in about six weeks' time. So they are they're back uh, on, on the less expensive uh, hydro uh, energy source, um, really didn't need to eat into their diesel reserves as they thought they would because of the major conservation effort that was underway. But it's a good story in, in, in Juneau, and I think it demonstrates how, when pressed, we, we truly can work to conserve more. I'm not convinced that we all need to go six days without bathing, but uh, <laughs> each to his own. Great. Yes, please. Kind of a puffball question. I'm Joan Bondreff. I'm a maritime attorney at Blank Roman Town and appreciate all your comments today and all the work that you've done on renewable energy also. Uh, following up your remarks, uh, and I've followed this issue for too long, is there any chance you can convince your Republican brethren this year to get the Law of the Sea Treaty ratified finally? Well, we are working on uh, moving the Law of the Sea uh, Treaty. In fact, I uh, just met with uh, Jim Connaughton from the administration yesterday. I've had an opportunity to meet with uh, Mr. Moore, some others, on just how we move it. Um, as you know, there are some in, on the Republican side particularly that have concerns, that have issues. Uh, in, in discussing this with them, um, I get the impression that they're going back to the beginning of the Law of the Sea Treaty when Ronald Reagan said, hey, this just doesn't work. Well, we made changes to that. We, we, we addressed the concerns um, and, and, and have a, a treaty that uh, I think perhaps some of our colleagues, in fairness, are not giving full view to. Then you throw in the, the, the whole aspect of energy resources and what that means in terms of, of uh, not only energy security, but, uh, but just security as a nation. And I think the discussion is, is, is greatly amped up. Again, when you're talking about 25 percent, potentially 25 percent of the world's uh, oil and gas reserves, uh, up north, and you have other countries that are looking to, to lay claim to that. And we as a nation, um, as we attempt to, to be less dependent on others, is it not reasonable that as an Arctic nation we would want to lay stake to our claim? Uh, so I think the whole energy debate has has helped to bring about a renewed focus on Law of the Sea. That's something that I would like to, to combine as we are debating energy on the floor in these next couple weeks. We're doing the vote count now. And um, uh, we recognize that there are some members who, in an election year, would just as soon not deal with it this year. 
And so if it's not really going to happen, I don't really need to give you my commitment one way or another. And that's kind of the, the, kind of the limbo that we're in right now. Um, but I do, I do intend to see if we can't um, advance it uh, yet this year. I recognize that our calendar is very skinny. We've got just this week and next before we go out for uh, August recess, we come back in and we really have about two and a half weeks of, of business time before the scheduled um, adjournment for the recess, or excuse me, for, for the end of session. Um, but think about it. We've made some pretty good progress, uh, I believe, with the treaty this year. I would hate to have to start all over again in the next Congress. Additional hearings. Um, uh, it, it just, I would like to think that, that, that the facts on the ground right now would help us push it over the edge. I recognize the calendar does interfere, though. Great. I'm going to take two questions together because I know the Senator's on a tight schedule all the way in the back, and then you, sir, and then we'll have to wrap up. Katie Green in Clean Skies TV News. Can you comment on the Alaska House vote last night concerning TransCanada? Uh, for those who, oh, you wanted me yeah, to take the other one? Take yeah, just. Uh, thank you. Er Ernie Prieg, Manufacturers Alliance. If the Congress and the President should give a clear green light uh, to drill in ANWA, uh, how many years would it take for the oil to start flowing? Great questions to end up with. Uh, first, let's go to Aegea. For those of you um, who didn't read this morning's news on Alaska, our state house um, passed by a vote, I believe, of 24 to 16, um, uh, a measure that would uh, give TransCanada the opportunity to um, begin a process towards, um, uh, towards a natural gas pipeline, moving the gas from the North Slope uh, across the state of Alaska into Canada and, and feeding into the lower 48. A 3,500-mile uh, 3, pipeline, uh, incredibly major uh, project for, for the state and certainly for the nation. Um, it's kind of that first step, if you will. Uh, I think it is a, a strong signal um, that the, the state administration is intent on getting uh, uh, Alaska's gas to market. Uh, we have another proposal that is still in the mix. This is uh, a proposal that's known as the Denali proposal, and it is spearheaded by ConocoPhillips and uh, British Petroleum. They are proceeding along with uh, applications with the FERC to move forward uh, a project, same, basically the same concept. So what you have is a, a pipeline builder, TransCanada, looking to, to uh, make this project happen. You have two of the three major producers that hold the gas um, in the state of Alaska looking to build a line. Uh, I remain optimistic that um, the pipeline company and the producers will come together and we'll get gas in the pipe and we'll get it to the market. We need it. As far as Anwar, we need Anwar's oil as well. You ask about the timeline. Um, uh, Estimates have ranged anywhere from five years to ten years. Um, I remain a little more optimistic about a shorter time frame for actually getting uh, Anwar gas to, into the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and, and flowing south. We have uh, we've got better technology than we've ever had in the past when it comes to exploration and drilling, the 3D seismic to identify where it is that we need to be. Um, and, and, and that helps us speed the process up. Our, our real issue in Alaska um, has always been with the litigation that ensues when we attempt to, to develop. Um, uh, a perfect case in point is Shell Oil uh, has, has bid very heavily on leases up north offshore. They have been limited completely for two full seasons from any activity because of, of litigation that is tied up in the, the Ninth Circuit. 
So for two full years there has not been a resolve of this and a company that is prepared and has ships waiting to move, people hired and ready to go, and we've been shut down because of the, the, the lawsuit. Um, and in the rest of the country, people are saying, well, where's Alaska's oil? Where's Alaska's gas? I've got a lot of my colleagues on the Senate floor as we speak that are saying, we don't need to be, we don't need to be uh, uh, leasing more, whether it's offshore or onshore. We just need to get the oil and gas folks to, to drill more, produce more on the lands that they have. I don't know about any of you, but if you are, are – uh, a fortune teller and you can tell me exactly where that oil is and exactly how much is there, uh, you, you know, you should get into the business. <laughs> but um, we've got some real challenges when it comes to the, the, the real production of our real resources. ANWR holds the greatest onshore opportunity for us um, domestically, and yet we're, we're prohibited we're going to make a go at it um, in this debate and have an opportunity, um, we're hopeful, to have a, an up or down vote on, on ANWR again. Um, we remain uh, ever hopeful because I believe it's the right thing for, for this country that where we can do more, we do so. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Great. Thank you, Senator, so much. Well, no pun intended, but we're going to drill down a little bit into a couple of other issues here. We've got a very distinguished panel uh, to talk about various aspects of Arctic issues and continue the conversation. We have two CSIS scholars. As you can imagine, this is an issue that actually crosses a number of programs at CSIS, the Europe program, obviously my own program, but also the Energy program and the Americas program. Uh, so we've got multiple teams looking at this. But we also wanted to bring down a very notable expert uh, from MIT uh, and give some of her thoughts on these issues as well. So I'm going to introduce the three panelists, let them all make a few minutes of remarks, and then again we'll open up the floor for questions. So first and foremost, we're going to start with David Pumphrey, who is the Deputy Director and a Senior Fellow in the Energy Program. He will then be followed by Caitlin Antrim, the Executive Director of the Rule of Law Committee for the Ocean at MIT. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Dwight Mason is here. He's a senior associate with the CSIS Americas program and will be very helpful in looking at this issue from yet another angle. So, David, we're going to kick off with you, and uh, thanks to all three of you for joining us. Well, thanks, Julie, and it's a, a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. The um, comments on energy, I think, were framed very well by the Senator. The uh, focus that's been taken on the Arctic in terms of the energy potential and the resources that could be brought to bear um, over the, the next decades. But just to review some of these uh, issues a little bit, and then we can open up for questions later, um, the Energy Information Administration recently came out with this latest uh, long-term outlook, which takes us to about 2030, which is sort of the, the edge of new um, Arctic development in many ways. We're still looking at the possibility of increasing our uh, consumption of oil by about 50 percent over that time frame and doubling our consumption of natural gas. So we have very strong continuing worldwide growth in fossil fuels. Now this is a conventional – what I would call a conventional forecast business as usual. A lot of things are at, at play now, and I'll come on that in a minute, that may change the direction of those forecasts. One of the key issues that we believe that's been driving up uh, oil prices over the last year to year and a half is a real change in the outlook on future oil supplies. It's really a switch from the belief that um, oil supplies and oil production will increase in a way that helps to meet increasing demand and prices going up uh, fairly you know, um, readily, but uh, not, not dramatically to now an outlook that says we, we may not have that much oil out there. There are a real supply pessimism. And so this look into the future that says demand looks like it's unstoppable and supply looks like it may not grow has really been one of the factors underpinning prices. The areas available for development, some of the factors that drive this are that the areas available for development um, around the world keep shrinking dramatically. So those uh, fields and resources available to international oil companies have, have really dwindled and really the oil resources are very much in the hands of uh, individual governments and their state companies. And it's their decisions that have driven people to think that perhaps 
oil supplies won't be coming forward. So enter a, an Arctic um, perspective that sees increasing access because of climate change with the ice um, um, uh, moving back and the possibility of bringing those resources into play. The um, uh, oil and gas development has been going on in the Arctic region for some time. It's mostly been onshore. It's been all around the Arctic, which I think lends people to think that since it's all around the Arctic, you're likely to be able to find it extending out into the Arctic Ocean areas. But you've got first the Alaska North Slope developments, uh, Russian developments in, in their far north, the Canadians looking at McKinsey Delta gas. Um, all of those things have been going on for a while. I think one of the more important recent developments have been in Norway where uh, the uh, Norwegians have been able to move out into the Arctic region and the offshore area and develop new technology that's allowed them to develop the Snowbit field and bring this into production. And this becomes a, um, a pathway forward for future offshore development in ice um, areas that are subject to, to ice and very rugged conditions. Other areas that are coming forward, um, the Senator mentioned the, the Russian developments in the offshore and the potential for these hardened um, uh, platforms. This is really a reference to the Stockman uh, gas field, which is um, actually quite far offshore from, from Russia. There's been quite a bit of discussion going on. They're working in a joint venture now with Total and Stad Oil Hydro, at least, at least for the present, that's the, the partner. That's been an ever-changing uh, process. But um, this will be a major step out in terms of um, offshore development. And it's many years into the future. Um, in addition, you've got companies bidding, and again, the Senator mentioned this, for rights to develop in the uh, US uh, offshore Alaska area, in the Beaufort region and in the Chukchi Sea area. So you see that companies are believing that they can move into these areas and begin developing. Off Greenland, you see discussions going forward. So there's a lot of interest and a lot of um, activity that is moving from the onshore areas in the Arctic into the, into the offshore. A little bit of a discussion about oil and gas resource. What do we really know? And the, the answer is we don't really know it very well yet. Um, Wood McKinsey, uh, a major petroleum uh, industry consulting firm, had issued an estimate that I think is the one that talks about the 25% of remaining resources. I've had a little trouble tracking back the 25%. But they put out an estimate of 233 billion barrels of oil equivalent that could be recovered in the Arctic. It's just that about two-thirds of that so far is undiscovered. So for many people, undiscovered is not the same as actually being ready to be drilled. But there's a lot of oil out there. The US Geological Survey did a study on the east, uh, just a region of eastern Greenland, which uh, their mean estimate of oil that could be recovered. And again, this is assuming current technology, was about 9 billion barrels in that region and about 60 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Very important area, a very small part of the Arctic. The USGS is completing, and I think we'll be releasing pretty soon, a new estimate of um, the circumpolar region to come up with a better guess at the, I uh, should let me say estimate, not guess, um, at the, uh, the oil and gas resources. And we're planning as part of our program to have a session with them hopefully late August, early September, that will allow for an uh, in-depth discussion of these estimates and what the implications are for uh, future production. So there's a lot of activity already, a lot of hope for future uh, oil, but what are the issues that have to be confronted in developing uh, oil and gas in the region? Well, I've already mentioned technologies. It's a very harsh um, area. It's going to require advances in technology that, uh, and doing things in ways that we haven't done them before. We're beginning to see a pathway forward through the Norwegian and then the Russian uh, developments. That leads to the next issue, which is cost. This will be very expensive oil, be very expensive technology. It's going to be far removed from um, consumption areas. It's going to require major investments in infrastructure to move the resources to market. And I think we've already seen in the debate that's gone on for so long around Alaskan gas resources as well as the McKinsey Delta gas resources that these issues can drag out for, for many, many years. There's another issue that has been discussed um, by engineers and others that if we continue to see the warming in the region and the potential uh, thawing in the permafrost, this really changes the ability of these regions to support traditional pipeline um, construction. So we may need new technology. Um, we may need um, uh, to take the oil out and oil and gas out more by tankers, which means more tanker traffic in the region. And then the final point I close on is something that the, the senator also referenced, which was the concept of, well, we've got to produce more and consume less. 
Well, at some point, those paths cross. And so we do have the question of where do our policy decisions currently under underway take us as we try to lower our fossil fuel consumption as well as shifting our transportation sector from, from gasoline into some other fuel, how does that then develop, uh, affect the development of these resources, which on the time horizon are maybe 30 years out for some of the more e extreme areas, 30 years plus. So I think those are all issues that we'll have to be uh, confronted as we look forward. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, David. Caitlin, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm guessing that very few of you have actually read this book. We all talk about the law of the sea. Joan, you probably have, and I know Ash has. Um, we all talk about the importance of the law of the sea, but in the debate in the Senate, very few people actually deal with, with the parts of it. I'd like to give a really quick summary, sort of sprint through it, and then use not the United States, but Russia as an example of how the, the law matches with national interest. Um, at the end of World War II, we lost, and it was the United States that actually broached the three-century-old concept of freedom of the seas, a freedom that was based on the idea that when one person used the sea, they left it behind undiminished for anyone else, that if you sailed a ship uh, halfway around the world, it didn't interfere with anyone else. If you exploited fish, which were abundant and people were few, you did not diminish the fishery resource. By 1945, as we saw ourselves moving out on the continental shelf for oil and gas, as we saw diminishment of fishing, uh, uh, fishing resources be, uh, begin, the United States, uh, the President, made proclamations extending control over continental shelf resources and establishing the right to manage nearshore fisheries beyond three miles. Uh, but that was followed by other countries extending their rights, uh, their claims, uh, to a point where we went through several attempts to recodify the law of the sea, to put it in writing to make it stable. Uh, that process went through three conferences, completing in a, a, the convention in 1982, renegotiating the convention to meet Ronald Reagan's uh, objections to it in 1994 and coming into force at that time, a 50-year period to revise a 300-year-old uh, uh, concept of law of the sea. What we have now really is not just a good law for the oceans in general. It is surprisingly applicable to the Arctic, that what it addresses are navigation issues, the rights to send ships, both warships and commercial ships and scientific vessels, uh, to places around the world, to be able to use the high seas with much the same freedom that we've had in the past, to be able to let nations extend their territorial sea from that narrow three-mile band at least to 12 miles, um, and to deal with those areas where 12-mile territorial seas overlapped. Many of the critical straits Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, Straits of Malacca, Strait of Gibraltar are under 24 miles wide and under the old law of the sea that would have become territorial sea and we would have been subject to a very limited in innocent passage regime. The convention created a new regime called transit passage which will come up in the Arctic uh, that allows us to send vessels through under much more uh, lenient provisions, allows warships to continue acting as warships. Uh, and gives us the, the freedom of maneuver that we needed. Um, on the resource side, it e extended uh, national control from the territorial sea to 200 miles. That's control of living resources and mineral resources. In addition, it took the definition of the continental shelf, which was very vague. It said the continental that we controlled the minerals of the continental shelf out to the depth that allowed exploitation, but being tied to continental shelf and geologists being as, as anal retentive as lawyers were prone to say the continental shelf really ended at about 200 meters depth. One of the things the convention did was redefine that to the most expansive definition of continental shelf you can imagine. Um, and as an example, that, that little tongue of 
of light blue coming down from the, the northern end of the, uh, the ocean there is the uh, Chukchi Plateau. It falls within the area that the U.S. wants to claim. Um, and it extends at least 600, 650 miles north, perhaps farther, uh, far beyond that 200-mile uh, zone. So that's one of the examples of, of what comes from this new convention. Um, at the time the convention was negotiated, we knew well the problems of environmental pollution from vessels, whether it was from uh, emptying bilges or whether it was from a disaster. We knew what the problems were and we could address vessel source pollution quite well, and that's written in great detail in the convention. This was also beginning just after the Stockholm Conference uh, completed its work. We knew environment was a problem, an issue to be addressed. We didn't know how. So there are very general provisions in the convention for dealing with land-based sources of pollution, really directing countries to address this as a problem, to develop international standards, and then to enforce those standards. Um, there's a, the whole area of international cooperation comes up in the areas both of environmental protection and in terms of uh, collaborative science, which the, the senator mentioned uh, for the International Polar Year. It's been very important and it's one of the things that's really directed by the convention. There are two things particularly addressed, uh, that address the Arctic. One is that there's a provision for allowing a coastal state more control over um, navigation through ice-covered areas of their EEZ. Um, obviously, this only applies to a few states. It will apply to the United States, uh, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, uh, Norway, and Russia. Um, and it will be incorporated into navigation provisions as they go along. Uh, the other is that people don't think of it, but that's a Mediterranean Sea. It's an entirely enclosed sea, at least it's enclosed by the exclusive economic zones. And under the convention, that is an enclosed sea. One of the things that this provides is that the nations bordering on a semi-enclosed seas have a responsibility to coordinate among themselves policies dealing with environment, with science, with the general environment for the people who live there. That, in fact, is the basis on which the Arctic Council is based. It is a five-nation, and, and for anyone who's worked through the negotiations on Law of the Sea or perhaps the uh, Conference on Environment and Development, one of the things you learn is you really want to avoid global conferences. That having 150 nations with delegations of 10 to 100 people does not make for a very fast process for dealing with problems. So this allows the, the Arctic Council to address problems of concern to them invite other members in and invite uh, native people in as well. So it, it's a very flexible system. It doesn't have its own bureaucracy, but it identifies problems and finds ways to address them. Um, it's a very unique uh, process, but it was one that somebody had that in mind 50 years ago and worked it into the system. Um, the convention also has provisions for uh, mandatory settlement of disputes, particularly those dealing with uh, environmental issues um, and with fishing issues. Uh, there are exceptions for military uh, activities. Uh, there are also provisions for sovereign immunity of warships, so that this takes out of the, the, the resolution of conflicts areas those things that are of critical uh, power issues, so that those still have to be addressed nation to nation. But it does address most of the economic problems that, that were part of the reason for the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, now, let me tell you how this fits in with Russia, because I, I find this very interesting. And, and you know, for the last year, all the newspaper articles have focused on Russia's doing this, Russia's doing that. What are we doing? What's, if you read Canadian newspapers, it's practically a war. I finally understand the lead up to the Spanish-American War, because I swear the newspapers are just following in the footsteps. The Law of the Sea Convention actually provides the underlying system of governance for the Arctic. And it, uh, it, let me look at these examples. For, for Russia, as for the United States, that whole area is a strategic area. It's where we send our submarines. It's where, where part of our nuclear uh, uh, 
system lies. It's also an area that we overfly. Uh, for those who have been paying attention, uh, some of the Russian bombers have been coming strikingly close to American territory, but they are following the, the, the rules of the convention that allow uh, navigation in and above the exclusive economic zone, something that's important to us as well. Um, also, as we've talked about the Northwest Passage running through Canada, that whole coast along Russia is called the Northern Sea Route. And that too has opened up for navigation. And in the past it has been open for navigation, mainly for the Russians to move among their ports. But it is an area that, that for people moving from Asia to Europe is a very important future direction for tr uh, navigation. And one of the things the convention does is it sets rules and limits on coastal states as to how much they can, can limit the freedom of navigation both through the economic zone, uh, particularly ice covered economic zone, and through the territorial sea. And if you notice, there are a few islands there where it would be a lot easier to, to go between the island and the mainland than to have to go out deep into the Arctic where the ice will be uh, thicker and more difficult to go through. So that, that is something that the convention addresses more to our interests than to Russia's, but it's one that they will have a concern with. Um, you see that large expanse of light blue. When we talk about Russia putting in a huge claim to the continental shelf, we're talking about the, the area beyond 200 nautical miles from, from the nearest land. Well, they've got, a, as you can see, a large shelf in any case. Even if they didn't reach for areas like the Lomonosov Bridge, that, that line running across the center there, they would still be putting a huge claim in. And for them, this is one of their sources of wealth. They have a lot of rebuilding to do, a lot of economy to build back up that was lost in the 1990s. And they see this as an engine of development. In fact, this is very much to them what the Gulf of Mexico is to us right now. It is their source, source of oil and gas, of energy resource, and of foreign exchange. Um, another simile is that this to the Russians, this passageway, the Northern Sea Route, is to them what the Panama Canal is to us. It is the connector between their Atlantic fleet, their northern seaports, and their Pacific fleet. The distance to go from Vladivostok to Murmansk in this way is probably one third, certainly less than one half of the long way around. It serves them, as I say, the same interest, and, and you know how important the Panama Canal is to the United States. This is the same thing to them. Uh, one other aspect, and I mentioned pollution had been one of the things that we had not addressed very in very much detail. As in the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi River feeds in with the central watershed of the United States, there are three main rivers, the Lena, the Yenisei, the Ob in Russia, each with the water throughput of a Mississippi. They all feed into the Atlantic. They all come from the Siberian heartland. As Russia develops, and as the climate changes, we're going to see agriculture, we're going to see timbering, we're going to see those trades coming down the river, but along with it will come the water runoff. We're going to see industrialization. We're going to see Russia need exactly the same things we needed for our rivers 50 years ago, a Clean Water Act. That we need to find a way to get them to do that because this is our Arctic as well. And Russian pollution from development will hurt us as much as it hurts them. So that that's something to consider. That's, that's partly the work of, through the Arctic Council. It's addressed in the convention that countries are supposed to deal with this. It's a lever, providing we're in there to pull the lever. Now, one last thing I wanted to address was something the Senator raised, the idea that we could stay out of the convention and pick and choose. We, there's no reason why we can't set, we can make a claim. We, Actually, we don't have to go out and do any scientific work. We could just draw a line on that and say that's ours. We're the United States. We have a Navy. That's the argument. We tried that, not with, with this, but in 1982, when we rejected the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, the, the Congress had passed the Deep Sea Bed Hard Mineral Resources Act, and we approved four mine site claims by private companies on the grounds that they had partners from all the other seabed mining countries who was going to object to it. 
Well, it turns out the people who object to it are the banks. For miners, for oil drillers, title is and exclusivity are the most important things. And what's happened in, in seabed mining is that all once once the treaty came into force, all the signatories, all their companies, withdrew from the American consortia. There are now eight mining operations all approved under the convention. Uh, they are actually quite active. I got to run my hands through the manganese nodules uh, recovered by India uh, last February. Um, and the U.S. companies, one dissolved and transferred its, its mine site to Germany, which is registered under the, the uh, uh, Seabed Authority. One dissolved entirely and nobody has that site. A third company pulled out, transferred it to Lockheed. So Lockheed now holds two sites. They have no partners. and. They can't get their license renewed because Congress never got around to refunding the program. That NOAA has no funds to actually process these applications. So what we've seen is staying outside of a convention does have a hard impact on industry. And I would expect that same impact to be felt on a unilateral claim, one that has no chance of getting foreign investment, or if an oil company is a subsidiary of a foreign uh, company, I would expect them to not be moving ahead. I wouldn't expect Shell U.S. to move into this if the parent company, uh, since the parent company is a, uh, under a party to the treaty. So there are costs to staying outside, but still this convention, through its rules, through its, its resolution of conflict provisions, and through its means of, of collaboration, particularly uh, implemented in the Arctic Council, is the system of governance for the Arctic. And so for all, every time one of those newspapers comes out and talks about the, the impending conflict, that, that the ships are going to be attacking each other, or uh, that the planes are going to fly down and, and into our airspace, it's, it's wrong. That the system's there, we just need to be a more active part, and it's hard to be a leader when you aren't owning up your own responsibilities. So my argument is, is and has been that we need to be a party to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Dwight, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. It's interesting to hear me describe as a scholar at CSIS. <laughs> um, I am, in fact, you know, a retired Foreign Service officer, uh, having been political counselor, then, then deputy chief of mission in our embassy in Ottawa, and subsequently for eight years as a political appointee as chairman U.S. Chairman of the Permanent Joint Board of Defense, Canada, U.S. So my focus on this and I was asked is about Canada. But before saying that, I would say I think I certainly agree with Senator Murkowski in the panel that um, it's a no-brainer that we really do need to adopt the Law of the Sea Convention. It's the only sure way to protect our interests in the Arctic economically and effectively. Um, I don't think it's worth a lot more discussion than that. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. We have, um, however, U.S. and Canada. We have three differences with Canada with respect to the Arctic. First is the Beaufort Sea boundary. The second are the Canadian Strait baselines enclosing the Ar Canadian Arctic Islands. And finally, there is the Northwest Passage. In the case of the Beaufort Sea, this is our only bilateral difference. Canada claims a meridian line straight north heading to Santa Claus, while we claim an equidistant line. The result of this is there is a wedge shape, a pie shape um, growing ever wider to the north disputed zone. Uh, the settlement of this dispute is, in fact, is important because absent agreement, exploration development of the hydrocarbon resources present there is impossible for the reasons Caitlin alluded to, title and surety. It's not bankable. Both countries are losing at the present for this. And I can remember once 20 years ago trying to negotiate this without any luck at all. Um, it seems to me that in this case the way ahead is for the United States to be big brother here and accept the Canadian claim in exchange for significant economic advantages. Uh, merely such a proposal might cause the Canadians to get smart and split the difference. Who knows? But at the moment, we both lose. Um, that's not smart. On the straight baselines, straight baselines are, are the line, are baselines are where you figure the territorial sea from and all the others. The Canadians have, have uh, straight baselines are appropriate and permitted in many, to simplify a complex shoreline and close small bays and indentations. You look at the map, and Canada certainly has a complex coastline around all those islands. And so straight baselines are not an unreasonable idea. The problem with the baselines Canada has drawn is that they are excessively long and do not meet the uh, standards of the Law of the Sea Convention. 
we have never recognized Ignatian baselines and still don't. Um, this is a this is not a major problem at the moment, but if if later on, if there were to be difference about where the boundaries of these various d districts were when it came to exploration, there might be a, might be a problem. And finally, from the point of view of defense, we in Canada have agreed do agree to defend the North America writ large together, and it'd be nice to know where North America actually was up there. Um, the Northwest Passage is a strait connecting two oceans. That's why it's an international strait. It has nothing to do with how often it's used. Uh, one of the oddities of the Northwest Passage is it's not too clear where it is all the time. That is to say, there are many routes through there, and I think it's kind of hard to argue that all of them are the Northwest Passage. But the Canada has not raised that point. Um, the fact that the Northwest Passage is an internationally recognized international strait doesn't mean that Canada is not sovereign there. It merely means that Canadian sovereignty is limited by rules applying to an international strait as set out in the Laws of the Sea Convention, to which Canada is a party and to which Canada is bound. Um, and we, I might add, I believe, have recognized that portion of the Laws of the Sea Agreement as, as um, customary international law anyway. Canada, like other coastal states, can make regulations for safe navigation, environmental protection, and so on in this strait, provided that these regulations conform to the standards of the convention and meet with the approval of the International Maritime Organization. Um, since the principal reason why Canada is asserting fairly absolute sovereignty in the strait is for those two reasons, one would think that Canada would be well advised to, in fact, observe the principles of the convention and use the opportunities presented by it and the International Maritime Organization to, in fact, impose such standards. Very Great. Thank you very much, Dwight, for giving us the Canadian perspective, which is also a, a key component. And uh, certainly in the Europe program, I want to make sure that we don't focus strictly on some of the transatlantic issues, but include uh, that side of the equation as well. We're going to open up the floor uh, now for questions. And again, please just be sure to introduce yourself uh, and let, you know, let us know uh, what's, what question you have on your mind. Who'd like to start? Yes, please, go ahead. I'm Courtney Vaughan. I'm with Gulf Lady CV. We're an investment firm in Washington, D.C. And my question is, um, I could someone from the panel address um, Britain's role in the probably future development of that region and if there is any political constraints or challenges that the U.S. may see coming from Britain if they ratify you know, the, the treaty, that sort of thing. Given the historical factors, I think, with Britain and the sea and the assets, you know, the old shipping assets, et cetera. Um, recently, the European Union uh, made a statement about the importance of protecting their rights in the uh, in the Arctic, um, I think they, that the EU in general and the UK in particular felt left out. Um, but they do have have uh, a number of, of interests in the region that do need to be recognized, and there are provisions to do so. Um, one, of course, is transportation. The savings in trade, the savings in cost of trade from uh, Asia. Uh, from uh, uh, East Asia to the, uh, Europe is significant by moving across to the Northern Sea Route. So they do have an interest in making sure that that shipping, whether it's under their flags or under other flags, is able to get through uh, without undue burden and without undue cost. Um, they also, as the EU in general, have an interest in resources and in protecting uh, Norwegian interests. Um, Svalbard uh, is a case in point, uh, which has come up recently because the Russians sent a, a frigate and a cruiser up there to do a, a freedom of navigation demonstration in the EEZ, uh, the Svalbard uh, archipelago. Um, and the question of, of resource exploitation, the agreement on, on Svalbard was developed before the Law of the Sea Convention was ever negotiated, so there are 
two sides of an argument, and most countries involved have stayed out of the argument. So there'll be an, an interest there. Uh, the direct interest of the UK, of course, just run to the continental shelf north of the UK. Uh, they're working on that, but that is quite a ways from the Arctic. Uh, there's also the interest in energy development. Just getting more energy into the world market is a plus. Um, so those are the main direct interests. I think there's also that, that sense of we don't want this resource and this, this issue area because the uh, Arctic is also an environmental issue and a, a, a climate change issue. Uh, we don't want to be left out. So they, that's one reason for, for raising a bit of a fuss there, there, I think. But their direct interests are more limited. Great. Yes, please. Uh. Thank you. I'm Soren Jens, member of the Danish Embassy. Um, a question on the legality. If, if, um, if within the Law of the Sea Convention agreements are finally reached on the division of the territory in the Arctic, what, what are the consequences of American lack of participation in the, in the treaty? Would, would you envisage it meaning the Americans were left out? Would American non-participation mean that we couldn't finalize an agreement? Or would, you know, would there be a kind of opt-in or you know, a special case where, where the U.S. would then be a party to a, an international treaty but not, or an international agreement but not still not to the treaty? Well, how do you see that playing out or is it simply as long as the Americans aren't in, we will ne we're never be going to be able to get to a solution. Um, when you're dealing with a small group of countries, the, the five Arctic states in particular, or the eight uh, principles of the, the uh, Arctic Council, there's a lot you can do to work out issues. The one you can't work out is security of tenure, uh, exclusive access, uh, making the bankers feel happy. So that, that's one of the definite costs there. Uh, in the Arctic region, I don't think there's so much of a problem that might be experienced elsewhere, and that's that um, U.S. flag vessels will not have access to some of the dispute resolution provisions. Um, I'm thinking back to the 1960s when our tuna vessels were periodically impounded in Cuba, and the Congress authorized the U.S. government to pay the fees to get them out. Uh, the convention has a nice system for prompt release so that vessels can be freed while court cases go on, but we wouldn't have access to that. I th there are a number of small things throughout the convention that you just can't take advantage of if you aren't party to it. Uh, it also leaves us in a position of having to resolve conflicts without using the settlement of dispute provisions. Uh, I would note, however, that with regard to fisheries, uh, the U.S. did in 1996 join the or sign the um, uh, agreement on high season str straddling stocks, which includes mandatory dispute resolution, and um, so that any objections people have to the Law of the Sea Convention on that ground, I just note that Jesse Helms gave his full approval to the United States taking part in in binding dispute resolution. Um, The costs of staying out are not limited to the Arctic either. Uh, particularly, that small promontory up there is perhaps one quarter of the extended continental shelf the U.S. Could, would be able to, to claim. Now, as I say, the U.S. can make a claim. Nobody else has to recognize it. And that's the trick, that, that what the parties to the convention do is they delegate to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf the responsibility for saying whether the claim is valid or not. And if the commission says it's valid, everyone has to recognize it. Well, that's a lot easier than trying to do bilateral agreements with every country that borders on your territory and everyone who says, you want something, we want something back. We've already given up some things to get this convention in place, and I see a benefit to it. But I think a lot of it will be bits and pieces all across the line. The other cost to the United States for staying out is there are provisions for amending the convention. Um, one of the nice features that made the U.S. very happy was if the convention is amended, but we don't ratify those amendments, everyone has to treat us by the terms that we ratified. 
that, that new ones cannot be forced on us. However, if the convention is modified and we ratify it later, we only have the option of accepting the modifications. The sooner we lock in the convention, which we like, the less threat we have of having a different convention. Or if we stay out of it and the convention is modified, who's to say what customary international law is? That if 155 countries, 155 countries and the EU, Congo just ratified last month, um, if those countries say this is the law and the U.S. says no it isn't, um, our, our warships may be able to go everywhere fine, but what about our transportation ships? What about uh, AT&T laying undersea cable? Uh, what about distant water fisheries, our shrimp fishers, our tuna fishers? Uh, there's a lot there that we stand to lose if, if, uh, if the convention changes out from under us. So those are the type of things that cost us from staying out. I've learned to answer questions short at some point, but <laughs> this is law of the sea. We don't do anything short. No, no, we, we appreciate your insight on these issues. Um, who's next? Who would, who would also like to ask a question? Any other residual questions? We stumped the audience. Um, great. Well, listen, this is the first of many events that CSIS is going to be hosting on this region, so we hope we can continue the dialogue. We hope Caitlin will come back. We hope we'll see Dwight and David up here again soon. And thanks for coming today. Please join me in thanking our panelists.